for a lie You get under, you get in And every bullet that came with an edge of life Was it the flame you tried to kill? kill, 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 kill. Your words on me even still Afraid they always will Rebecca Riley, and I'm the Teen and Adult Engagement Assistant Manager at OMSI, and I will be your host tonight. I'm super excited for this job of hosting y'all tonight. Um, I'm also really excited to learn more about really weird animals and um, their adaptations. Uh, before we get to the lecture, we've got a few quick announcements to go over. First is OMSI is committed to sparking curiosity and an igniting imaginations, if you weren't aware. Um, and to help everybody out at home, we've crafted and curated all sorts of engaging science activities and experiments to inspire you to experience the wonder of science from wherever you are. Please visit omsi.edu for more information and resources. And if you do any of the science activities, please send us photos or videos so we can say, see what great scientists you are. I hope you enjoyed tonight's pre-pub trivia and music by local Portland artist, Stephanie Schneiderman. She will be performing live inside OMSI's planetarium as part of our Kindle concert series at some point in 2021. So stay tuned for that. Putting on these live shows takes a lot of work and we have an amazing partner that helps us make this happen. So a big thanks and shout out to Celestream for providing the live streaming services for tonight's Science Pub. We really appreciate their support. We would also like to welcome you into the museum. We are in the final weeks of our Body Worlds exhibit. It's at OMSI through October 4th. So please check that out if you wanna see Body Worlds come before October 4th. We also have our USS Blueback submarine open for tours. Advanced tickets are required for that. And the health and safety of OMSI guests and staff is our utmost priority. And we want you to feel comfortable and safe while at OMSI. So to meet state guidelines and help limit the spread of COVID-19, OMSI has implemented some changes throughout the museum please visit omsi.edu for more information on coming to the museum. We are also really excited to host our third virtual OMSI After Dark, which is Cider Fest. We are curating, curating, curating a box of 10 delicious Oregon ciders. Tickets are $47 and include 10 cans of cider, two tasting glasses, and access to the virtual event where we'll talk to the cider makers and have a lot of other really cool uh, entertainment variety show kind of situation. Um, you can pick up your box at OMSI or have it mailed to you for $15 to anywhere in Oregon. So please visit omsi.edu slash ciderfest for more details. Also, Science Pub. We're still calling this a Science Pub even though you're at home instead of in a pub. But if you want to bring that pub experience back into your life. Um, please support one of these food and beverage partners that are around the state. They're wonderful and could use our support and also delicious. Here's what tonight will look like. It's going to be pretty similar to our usual science pub program and very similar to our usual virtual science pub program. Um, we will start with a animal adaptation themed trivia game that'll be a warm up for tonight's talk. So you can grab a pen and paper or some flashcards or just shout really loud um, so you can participate in that. After trivia, we'll have a lecture by Dr. Catania. And throughout that lecture, please put any questions you might have for Dr. Catania in the chat and we'll collect all those questions. And afterwards, we'll have a question and answer um, with the speaker. So you can continue to submit questions throughout the question and answer pretty much up until the very end. So definitely if you have any questions, don't be shy about asking them. 
And if you enjoyed tonight's lecture, please consider making a donation or purchasing a Science Pub pint glass. You can see a picture of those pint glasses on your screen there. They're very cute. And if you want to donate, you can go to onzi.edu slash donate or click that donate button on our Facebook page. But don't worry, there's no pressure to donate. Our mission at OMSI is to inspire curiosity and create engaging, engaging science learning experiences for people of all ages. So please sit back, relax, and get ready for a great lecture. Whew, that was a lot. Um, but before the lecture, it is my favorite time of the night. It's trivia. I would like to welcome one of our amazing educators, early childhood education coordinator, Abby Putnam. Hey, Abby. Hi, how are you? I'm doing great. How are you feeling? Pretty good. Are you ready for trivia? I hope so. I'll do my best. <laughs> I believe in you. I think you're going to be great. Um, you're a smart Thanks. cookie, so you can show off that smart cookiness. Um, Just made cookies, so. See, there we go. We're all on. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I know you said you like to be a part of a team when you do trivia. I don't know if you want to just consider everybody at home as being on your team. Um, they're very. Oh, that's supportive. a good idea. Yeah. <laughs> For those of you at home, if you have your quarantine with you, you can make some steaks before you play trivia. Maybe somebody who has to do the dishes or walk the dog or they just have to uh, genuflect before you anytime you enter a room and stuff. Um, so, yeah. OK. Trivia. We're ready. Are you ready? For trivia, I should say before we start, I keep doing false starts here. I'm going to ask each question give you a little bit of time and answer, and then I'll answer that question before we move on to the next one. So that's kind of how it'll go. Are you ready, Abby? Yes. Okay. Question number one. What is the name of the outer sheet of folded neural tissue in the human brain? Is it A, the mm -hmm. barrel cortex, B, the neocortex, C, the thalamus, or D, the gyrosulcus. Uh, well, I've only heard of one of these. <laughs> which the one? Thalamus. Which one have you heard of? Thalamus. Mm. The thalamus. The I've heard thalamus. of like the cortexes, but I don't. There, there are the cortex is like a chunk of the brain, and so we're wondering like yeah. what sheet of stuff that goes on top of that chunk. So it's like on the outside. Gyro. Like gyro. Like gyrate or gyroscope goes around. The gyroscope kind of helps you from falling over. That kind of helps you stick. Oh, up. so maybe that's in the middle. Mm. Or it's the thing that's keeping all your juice and your brain separated. I don't know. Ooh, you might have to just choose one. What are you going to go for? I'll go with the thalamus because I know it. <laughs> <laughs> The thalamus is a known thing, but it is a, a, it's a whole chunk of the brain. We were looking for neocortex. It's like on top of the cortex. Um, okay. Okay. But I really like your reasoning. I like your scientific process skills. We'll see if we can use those process skills on an even harder question. <laughs> How many touch nerve fibers end in the human hand? 170, so not very many. 1,700, medium amount, 17,000, a lot, or 170,000, a ginormous amount. Is it the, the tip of the finger there? Or no. Or is it the whole the, hand? The whole hand. It's both hands. It's Just both one. Hands. I believe it's one handy hand. Well, I went to see Body Worlds and I learned that your uh, capillaries and all your veins can go around the earth. So it has to be a lot, but probably not D. I'm going to say, I think it's probably C, 17,000. 17,000. You are correct. Yeah, that was yes. great. Okay, <laughs> so now keep this answer in mind when we talk about uh -huh. our so we're all going to remember the hand, the human hand is about 17,000. Now we're going to talk about the nerve endings on an animal. How many nerve fibers end in the mole, the star nose moles is nose star? 100, 1,000, 
10,000, 100,000, or one, whoa, there's maybe one too many zeros on that E. I want to say that's one million. <laughs> One to 10 million. <laughs> so, so the uh, human hand is 17,000. Do you think it's like a little less, a medium amount more, or like a whole ridiculous bunch more? <laughs> well, it, I think that like moles, do they all look like that? Moles use their nose to like sense a lot of stuff. So they're like smelling out worms and weird stuff, like through dirt. And they're also probably feeling with it. Man, that thing looks like it's got a sea anemone on its face. And they're all nerves. So I'm going to go with D. I'm going to, this thing might be small, but it's got a bazillion or a hundred thousand. hundred thousand. You are correct. That was great. Um, you're, you're doing great. You're coming back, um, back on top. I believe in you. Uh, I can't give you more context for this question, so I'm just gonna read it. How many power settings does an electric eel have? I don't know what they mean by power settings though. Maybe we'll learn in the lecture today. So we'll make a guess. One, oh yeah, I should read out the answers. Is it A, one, B, two, C, three, or D, four? I think the settings are like um, in Star Trek when you set your phaser to stun or to kill. Ooh. Or something like that. Yeah. So if, if like, the electric eel had a phaser, how many settings would it have? I think it's going to have three because its name has three letters. Well, the eel part does. Ooh. If that eel was a part of Star Trek, how many settings would its taser have or phaser? Three still. Oh, really? Star <laughs> Trek has three? <laughs> yeah. <I> still. Have- <laughs> <laughs> I'll give you half a point for that one. <laughs> it might have e- it might have eel setting also, like slippery. Oh yeah, maybe that's like the default zero setting. <laughs> yeah, we can ask that. If anybody has more questions about that, um, we can ask the the speaker. Okay, true or false? We've got a fifty fifty chance here. Electric eels are only found in South America. I bet they go on vacation. I don't know. Uh, uh, uh mm, false be- because they are in the Caribbean. <laughs> so it's, it depends if you call that South America. Oh, uh, I think. Probably no. it does. If it if that did count as South America, would you keep your answer or change it? I guess I'll change. Maybe it's true. Yeah, it's true. <laughs> Good job. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Number six. Ooh, we're gonna do some math here. Um, okay. yeah, math madness. Right How quickly can a fish begin to escape from a predatory strike? A tenth of a second, one twentieth of a second, one one hundredth of a second, or less than one one hundredth of a second. Uh, faster than I can answer this question, obviously. <laughs> All of the answers are faster. Uh, and, yeah, fast? this is crazy. I bet it's pretty like pretty fast. One. Hundredth of a second? That's like really fast. Like, I think it's probably C. C. Because that's impressive. Act- that sounds like a right thing to me. Oh, man. I was also wrong. Less than one one hundredth of a second. That's crazy. I want to hear more about this because that's I don't know how to count that short. I, I, yeah, I don't even know. Because we humans hit, we're, or, or as it's coming. For us, it, we have to like. Think about, like, it goes through this, like, whole process. So, for us, it, like, takes a while to do so. Okay. Which animal has venomous saliva, which is something I feel like I would be okay with having? Um, A, a water shrew. B, a tailed weasel. C, a short-tailed shrew. Or D, a star-nosed mole. Or the snake? 
Yeah, there's a picture of a snake there, but the snake's not one of the answers. Okay, that just reminds me about venom. Tentacle snake, but maybe that's probably not the right answer. A water shrew, a short-tailed weasel. A short-tailed weasel. Uh, a we- weasels are pretty gnarly. Maybe it's a weasel. <laughs> I have no idea. I have no idea either. Okay, well, let's just see. Let's both discover together that it was a short tail. Oh, look at that thing. Look at his eyeballs. Oh, so man. tiny. So excellent. good. That's an excellent looking creature. I want to hear more about its saliva. Okay. All right. We're almost done. We've got two more questions. Ooh, phew, true or false. So this can hopefully boost our confidence. Uh, true or false? Alexander von Humboldt got his electric eels by, quote, fishing with horses. So he went down to South America with some horses? Like a horse is on, like, on the hook, and then you throw the horse with your fishing pole? Probably not. It's, I bet it's some kind of Maybe net. Maybe it's a miniature huh? horse. Miniature Maybe it's horse. a miniature oh. horse. A net made out of horse hair. That, but it's still connected to the horses, maybe. I don't know. Where are you going to go? True or false? Uh, it sounds bizarre enough to be true. It is bizarre enough to be true. Oh, the horses are just next to the net. That's cool. That's still you cool. No, no, they might be bait. <laughs> <laughs> oh, maybe they are. Okay, maybe we'll learn more about this. I would feel really bad for those horses if they're like getting all shocky shocked on their hooves. Um, maybe the maybe they do fa- they do phaser level. <laughs> maybe. Okay, I forgot to keep track of your score, so I'm going to say you've had 100% so far. Good job, Abby. Oh, thanks. Last last question. Tentacled snakes spend their whole life in water and can stay underwater for how many minutes without coming up for air? Two minutes, 15 minutes, 22 minutes, or 30 minutes? So it's going to be more than two minutes because... It would be inconvenient to have to come up every two minutes. It would not be very like, impressive if it was two minutes. Yeah. Seals and like whales can go for like 30 or more. I, 22 seems like this really unround number. And maybe it's a red herring or a tentacle snake uh, herring. But I'm gonna go. I'm gonna try to win 22 and pretend that it's right. <laughs> oh, oh, close! It was 30 minutes. They can go 30 whole minutes without coming out for the air, even with their tiny little snake. Wow. They don't have big old lungs or anything like the seals and whales do. Um, thank you so much for going through this trivia with me. We learned a lot of really wacky facts, and I think we're gonna learn a lot more cool stuff during this lecture. Is there anything in oh, particular? Yeah. You, you really want to learn more about in the lecture after that trivia? I want to learn why you should not kiss shrews. Shrews? Oh, uh, oh short tailed so shrews? Yeah. yeah. What are they catching? Okay, so we're, hopefully we'll hear more about that venous, venomous saliva. Well, thank you so much for joining Abby, and I'll see you later. All right, bye. Thank you. Bye. Um, and now I would like to introduce our speaker, um, Ken Catania, PhD. A neuroscientist by training, Ken has spent much of his career investigating the unusual brains and behaviors of specialized animals. His studies often focus on predators that have evolved special senses and weapons to find and overcome elusive prey. Catania was named a MacArthur Fellow in 2006 and a Guggenheim Fellow in 2014. He received a Bachelor's of Science in Zoology from the University of Maryland and a PhD in Neurosciences from the University of California, San Diego, and is currently a Stevenson Professor of Biological Sciences at Vanderbilt University. So uh, take it away, Dr. Catania. Well, hey everyone. I hope everyone's having a good evening tonight. 
and I'm really happy to be able to talk to you a bit about the research that I've done over the years in my lab. But I want to start by thanking Rebecca and Melanie and also Jason, who's making it possible for the video to be shared with all of you guys, and also all the folks at the museum. So it's great to have the opportunity to tell you about some of these really interesting animals that I've had the privilege to study over the years. And I've described this in my book that just came out, Great Adaptations, and it's really, uh, I kind of think of it as a series of mysteries that were presented to me over the years and how um, these eventually turned out. Um, now, a lot of people that might be talking to you about biological studies, uh, especially in my field of neurosciences, might start out by telling you a little bit about what these studies tell us about ourselves. And I do want to give an example of that. So um, this is a squid. And in the 1900s, people figured out that these animals have absolutely huge neurons that are really large brain cells, essentially, or, or part of the nervous system that allow squid to conduct signals very quickly in order to escape from predators. And this finding led Hodgkin and Huxley to be able to figure out basically how neurons signal in virtually all vertebrates and, of course, also in humans. And they actually won the Nobel Prize for that work. So it's really a truism that a lot of these diverse species can end up teaching us something really general and important that may end up applying to humans as well. Now, having said that, though, I'm going to take kind of a different approach in this talk, and I took a different approach in the book, and that is I want to tell you about something that I think is more sort of discovery science, the way you might think about the Hubble Space Telescope, looking out into our surroundings and just seeing what's out there, because you often may discover something truly amazing. And a couple of examples are this uh, image from the Eagle Nebula, where the, it's basically um, the pillars of creation, where there are are gases, uh, mainly hydrogen, collapsing to create new stars. And so by looking at this kind of outlier, we not only got this amazing image, but we, we can see somewhere in the universe where new stars are actually being born. And I think that's, that's a, a pretty amazing thing. Another aspect that um, you might take or another view you might take is to look at something that might seem ordinary. And this is famously the Hubble Ultra Deep Field image, where they were just looking at what you might consider a bland, empty area of the night sky. And what they discovered was over 10,000 galaxies in that region. And that basically revised our whole view of the universe and in, in how much is out there. So, so you can sort of think of the same thing as happening very often. And it does uh, often happen in other branches of science where sort of an outlier leads you to look more closely and you dis discover something or something that looks kind of ordinary uh, ends up being extraordinary when you take a closer look. And both of those things have happened to me over my career. Now, of course, I'm going to be looking not out in the universe, but at Earth and the biological systems. I'm going to tell you just about a handful of them that I've studied. And I have here uh, a magnifying glass in this image to remind me that periodically in the talk, I'll have the image of a magnifying glass. And that what that signifies is, is there was in this part of the studies a really important clue to something interesting going on with the animals. And so you'll see that as I go along. Okay, so I'm going to now start with what is actually chapter one. And this was studies of the star-nosed mole. And the star-nosed mole is a really amazing creature that people had wondered about since, the, the, since it was first described. You know, what is going on with this really weird face and these strange appendages? What is the star for? How did it evolve? Does it give the mole some special ability, if any? Okay, so that's the, the first thing I want to tell you about. And I first got involved in these studies when I had the great opportunity when I was an undergraduate at the University of Maryland to volunteer at the nearby National Zoo in Washington. And I was, I, I joined um, an investigation that was focused, as you might guess, on the Starnos Mole. And what was going on at the time is um, the, the, they were trying to figure out what is the star for, and especially could it be used maybe to detect electric fields? Um, and, and that is something that a number of different species 
are capable of doing, including sort of well-known electric fish that generate their own electricity, but also sharks and amphibians that just detect electric fields that are out there in the environment. And so I was um, tasked with essentially running these experiments, um, designing ex experiments to test this possibility. But first and foremost, the zoo needed more star-nosed moles because they're really hard to get. And so I was sent out on what I now sort of think of as a snipe hunt because, um, you know, this is one of those famously impossible creatures to find. They live in wetlands in the northeastern United States and up into Canada. And so I drove up to uh, north central uh, Pennsylvania with a van full of live animal traps and uh, some maps and a bunch of earthworms to feed moles if I was lucky enough to find them. And I set out looking for wetlands where these animals might live. And I did eventually, through much exploration, discover some really amazing ecosystems. So this is part of the wetland where, in fact, Starno's moles are very common. And one of the things to know when you look at this sort of lush vegetation, that there's a lot of muddy, moist, swampy soil here. And through that soil runs a network of tunnels. And it's an amazing ecosystem because lots of different creatures use these underground tunnels that you would never know were down there unless you set out these little traps and tried to find out who's going through the tunnels. And so that's what I ended up doing. And it was essentially a crash course in mammal diversity. So every few hours I would check the traps and I would find different creatures down there. And, and, and so I'm gonna show you some of these beautiful and interesting animals. So one of the most common animals was meadow voles. And these guys are rodents. They have fairly big eyes. They use their whiskers a lot for exploring their tunnels and they eat the grasses and vegetation that are in the area and they reproduce a lot. So I ended up sort of wondering one thing while I was out there is why isn't the world made of voles? Because, you know, they have all the resources they seem to need and they uh, do reproduce um, fairly frequently. So I'll come back to that. So another creature that I ran into a lot was this short-tailed shrew, which is not a rodent. It's, it's actually in the historical family of um, insectivores, um, but um, it is unusual in that it has venomous saliva. So it's an unusual mammal. That's really rare among mammals. So you don't want to get bit by one of these guys. Of course, they're not going to come after you. They want to be going the other direction. And they're often ca caught by cats and owls and other birds and prey of prey and so forth. And they mostly eat insects and other invertebrates. Um, here's another shrew. This is one of the smallest mammals on the planet. It only weighs about three grams. And it's an incredibly fast little animal. Um, really interesting. It's got small eyes, also depends a lot on whiskers to explore. This is a different species of mole that lives on the fringes of the wetland. This is a water shrew. This is one of the smallest mammal divers. It'll dive at night searching for fish, crayfish, small insects, and, and so forth, uh, as its, its, its uh, metabolism is really high, so it has to eat very often. So all these animals using the same tunnels and here is a short-tailed weasel. And this is a beautiful animal. It's a predator, predator, of course. It's going down there. And um, here's where I'll say this is one of the reasons the world isn't made of voles, because actually um, right here is this guy's dinner. So this is what's left of one of the voles that it caught. So also a beautiful animal. Uh, this is, of course, what I was looking for. And I did eventually start to find these guys. So this is a star-nosed mole sort of head-on view with its big, heavily clawed front limbs and the 22 appendages that ring its nostrils, which you see here on either side. Now, I also wanted to show you what one of these guys looks while it's going through one of its tunnels, because this is a more realistic view. You can see the, the, that it's going through, touching the nose to, as it's searching for things. Really small eye, clawed back forelimbs, and its fur is always lustrous and clean, even if it's gone swimming in muddy water. Okay, so that's a little um, view of the creatures in the wetland. And now I'll come back to this question of the studies of electroreception. And I did wanna just point out that that turned out to be essentially a dead end. The, the moles were not responding to electric fields 
And that sort of left that as an open question, but that was okay because I had learned an immense amount about electroreception. I got really excited about going to graduate school to learn more about electric fish and sharks and salamanders and so forth. So I went to the University of California at San Diego and worked with one of the leaders in the field of electroreception and brain evolution, a guy named Glenn Northcutt. Um, and working together with him, of course, I, I learned a lot of new things, a lot of new techniques. In fact, I worked in a building, in this building right behind this, this, this uh, entryway to, and, and in that building, there was a really um, amazing instrument that, that I trained on, which was the scanning electron microscope. And I'd like to sort of think of some of these instruments as akin to the Hubble Space Telescope, because with this amazing instrument, you can look at the microscopic universe and often get equally beautiful images of biology, of uh, things that you just cannot see with the naked eye. And so actually, once I um, started looking at electroreceptors and other structures using this instrument, I couldn't help but think back about the star and wonder, hmm, you know, this is an instrument that uh, we really didn't have at the National Zoo. Maybe there was something that could be learned by taking a closer look at the star. And I went ahead and uh, talked to Glenn about this and um, he uh, supported a field trip back to Pennsylvania to take another look at this animal in a different sort of view. And in fact, it turned out that the star is an amazing structure when you look more closely. So here it is under the scanning electron microscope. Um, you might notice that each of these appendages is completely covered with these tiny little domes. So these circular domes that cover the appendages. And I'm going to zoom in on these. Now notice the whole star is only about a centimeter across. And it would be accurate to say that the entire star is made up of sensory organs. There's 25,000 of these little domed things, and they're called Imer's organs. And it turns out, actually, these are super sensitive touch receptors. You can almost think of them as sort of touch pixels, the way you might think of sort of light receptive pixels in a high resolution camera, except these pixels are for tactile investigations instead of for vision. Now I want to compare the star to the human hand because the human hand is sort of a triumph of evolution. It's sort of one of these very important touch organs for us. It has a big representation in our brains and it's thought of course to be responsible for a lot of the things that humans are able to do. So there are 17,000 touch receptors in the human hand so how does that compare to the star nose mole star? So here's the star at the same magnification as this hand. And it turns out there's 100,000 touch nerve fibers all compacted into the size of a single human fingertip. So that is a phenomenal innervation density and just gives you a little bit of insight into just how much touch resolution and acuity the star nose mole has. Uh, in order to explore its environment. Okay, so with that little preview of the, the sort of the mole's touch abilities, I wanna show you a mole in action and what they're actually able to do with this. So what you're gonna see next is a movie of a Starnos mole trained to find a tiny little X that's embossed on aluminum foil. And underneath that X that's, that you're gonna see outlined with the laser pointer, um, there's a food reward and you'll see just how quickly the mole can identify that little tiny tactile cue and then break through the aluminum foil to get its food reward. Okay, so that was a mole in action. And now I want to go back to the anatomy of the star and tell you about something really interesting and subtle. So while I was investigating the anatomy of this structure, taking some detailed sort of uh, mapping of the, of the sensory organs, I discovered something that was really kind of subtle. And that was 
there's this border between each of the appendages where there are none of these sensory organs. And that reminded me of something I had learned about quite some time ago. And I have to quote Pasteur here, who pointed out that in the field of observation, chance favors only the prepared mind. And by that, he's sort of referring to, you know, have you done your homework? And I had sort of basically seen something in one of my classes, and this related to brain organization, and I want to tell you about it. And so here's an image of the human brain, and br the, the human brain has many of what you would call brain maps contained within it that relate to different sensory systems. And one of the more famous one is called the Penfield homunculus. And it's basically the way the sense of touch is organized in the human brain laid out as a map of the human body from sort of the upper dorsal area down more laterally in this region of the cortex. Now, this is sometimes called a homunculus for essentially the little human in the brain. And it's characteristic of the neocortex this outer layered sheet in many different mammals. And there's a very special kind of brain map in rats and mice. And this is called the barrel field. And so if you look at the, the, the neocortex of a rat or a mouse, in the anatomy of their neocortex, you can see these little circular units of cells. And these are called cortical barrels. And they are essentially a visible brain map, meaning that each of these circles is where a single whisker on the rat's or mouse's face projects into the brain map of touch for that animal. And this has been a major model system in the neurosciences. There's actually multiple books written about this system and actually thousands of scientific papers written about it as scientists try to understand the fundamental organization of the neocortex. So I was reminded of this and those little borders in, on the star made me wonder, maybe there could be a visible brain map in the star nose mole as well. So Glenn Northcutt suggested I go talk to John Koss at Vanderbilt University, who is one of the world's experts on brain maps. And together we collaborated at looking at the neocortex of the star nose mole. And sure enough, there was a visible brain map in this species as well. Now, one of the things that I should mention that's true about the human brain map of touch as well is that only half of the body is represented on each side of the brain. So what you're seeing here is half of the star brain map. And I'm going to zoom in on this section because it gets more interesting from here. So here is, an, is a zoomed in closer up view of that visible brain map. And here is the star that goes, the half of the star that goes with this brain map. So it's a really interesting thing to be able to see the representation of the brain. It's almost like you could see the human hand in the human neocortex. And there's a lot of interesting things about this map. And I want to tell you just one. And I've got the magnifying glass here because there was another clue that something interesting was going on in star nose moles related to this map. And that is the question of why is this part of the brain map so very big? It takes up 25% of the moles touch brain map for this part of the body. And yet it's not very big on the star. It doesn't have that many Imer's organs. And so why might this be going on? And this is a question where you have to go back to animal behavior. And so now I want to show you the star nose mole in action, except slowed down. So this took a high speed camera viewed from below as the mole finds a piece of food as viewed on a plate of glass. So you can see what's happening. Okay. Okay, so what did you just see and why am I showing you a human eye? Well, what the star nose mole did there was to first touch with the side of the star and then very quickly shift to the center of the star and touch with that 11th central appendage. And that is the area of the brain map that's expanded in the map. 
And so the star-nosed mole, it turns out, is doing the same thing that we do with our eyes, meaning we have a small part of our retinal fovea, about 1% that's in high resolution, and we are constantly moving our eyes to focus in on things with that high resolution part of our eye. And star-nosed moles are doing the same thing with touch. So just to bring this point home, let's say you were to look at just this G on this picture. So then you wouldn't actually be able to read the rest of what's in this image. It would be more like this. So we think of, we, of things as being seen by us in sort of an image of a, just a picture, but really the only way you can analyze things in detail is to move your eyes around. And it turns out star moles are doing the same thing. They have a tactile fovea, and just as our area of high resolution in our visual system is expanded in the brain map for vision, the star mole's touch fovea for high resolution is expanded in its brain map for touch. So that's a really amazing parallel between a creature that seems totally alien to us and to what we are doing all the time in the way that our brains are organized. Okay, so that's one very cool thing about star moles, but I want to tell you something else. So uh, I used a very high speed camera to reveal the motions of the sort of the foveation movements of the mole star. What does it look like in real time? So the next movie I'm going to show you is not slowed down. This will be a star nose mole finding and eating eight things in a row. And it is some phenomenal speed. It turns out that star-nosed moles are the fastest foragers among mammals. And they're literally in the Guinness Book of World Records. So once we published how fast they can eat things, um, they, they, they turned out to be record holders. The shortest time that they can detect and eat something is 120 milliseconds. So that is less than a quarter of a second. And that means to identify it, make a motion to that 11th central appendage to be sure of what they're, they're touching, and then eat it, and then start to look for the next thing. So that is an amazing ability for an animal. And that was another clue to interesting things going on with star moles. Why, you might ask, are they so very fast? So now I'm going to tell you a little bit of a, a little quirk in the way that I sort of found the next clue about what was going on. So I went to a very large meeting, the annual Neuroscience Society meeting in Washington, D.C., which has 30,000 people in it and goes on for five days and has rows and rows and rows of posters. And you might think, well, maybe I made some discovery at this big scientific meeting. And actually it was the complete opposite. So I got overwhelmed as many people do and I needed to take a break. And so I went to a used bookstore called Second Story Books on DuPont Circle. And I just started walking around and I found this book on foraging theory about the ecology of animals and, you know, what are the choices that, that animals have, especially predators. And that, that includes um, the mathematical analysis of food and prey and how profitable they are. And one of the key things that people do in this sort of field of, of comparison of, of food choice among predators is to, is to rank food by profitability. And that is very simply the amount of energy gained from something you eat divided by the handling time. So what you just saw in that high-speed video uh, and, and in that real-time video was the handling time that star moles have. Now, Virtually no one's ever considered the possibility that handling time could approach zero. And yet, if that happens, if it gets incredibly short, then profitability skyrockets, right? Because this is in the denominator and anything in the denominator approaching zero is going to make this value get very large. And so that is a very interesting clue to star moles possibly being able to specialize on really small food. And that was another one of those clues because, in fact, if you look at the teeth of a star nosed mole, they are among the most unusual in the animal kingdom. So, at least for mammals. So, this is a normal, common, run of the mill mole, of which there's about 30 species, and they all have big front teeth. But the star nosed mole has these remarkable little, tiny, unusual front teeth. And here they are, closer up. And it turns out that these form essentially a little tiny pair of tweezers. 
And, you know, even if you were going to look at the fossil record, you could learn a lot about the, what an animal eats from its teeth. And now I want to show you where these teeth are. They're located right behind that 11th foveal appendage, that high resolution area. And now I'm going to show you a slow motion movie of the star again. And this time I want you not to look at the star, but look at how these teeth are used like a little tiny pair of tweezers. Okay, so those teeth, the speed of the mole, the analysis of their food items, and in fact, the fact that they live in wetlands where there are lots of little small food items to eat, and a number of other experiments and bits of evidence that I haven't sh had time to show you, basically all comes together to tell us that this unusual, enigmatic, mysterious structure is a super touch sensor for finding and eating very small, small food fast. And what that allows the star-nosed mole to do is basically have a, food, a, a resource of food that none of the other animals that are competitors with it in its wetland environment can even find. And even if they could find it, they wouldn't be able to eat it fast enough in, for it to be profitable and make sense to be part of their diet. So, so this uh, is, you know, uh, a sort of a lesson in looking at every possible clue when you're trying to solve a mystery. And I don't want to end there. And I couldn't help but put in something you might think of as a little bit unusual on the face of it. So this is an image from the old Ginsu knife commercial that used to be on television a lot when I was growing up. And, you know, they, they, they try to sell you this knife and, and they tell you it could cut through a, a beer can and then you could still slice tomato. Um, but the, 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 the sort of the punchline was always, but wait, there's more. They'll sell you the potato peeler with it and five other knives. And so um, I put that in because literally when I'm doing science and studying some of these unusual animals, I always find there's more to the story than you could possibly imagine. And so I want to tell you the next really strange thing about a star-nosed mole. So they live in wetlands, as I pointed out. How do they find food underwater? So no one ever had filmed a star-nosed mole in slow motion underwater as it was trying to find food. Um, so I decided to do this and just look at what was going on. And what I discovered was something really unusual. So as the moles were going about from place to place looking for food, they were exhaling air bubbles out of their nostrils and then re-inhaling the same air bubbles. This is a really bizarre thing to see. And it turns out what it's actually doing, what the moles are doing, is underwater sniffing. And you really have to see this to believe it. So I'm going to show you a video of a mole searching for food, again, in slow motion, and essentially how it is exhaling and re-inhaling these air bubbles. And I went on to show that these moles can actually follow a scent trail underwater. So they are, in fact, using olfaction underwater. So take a look at this. Okay, so I'm just going to tie things up there for star-nosed moles and point out that um, no one had believed that mammals could use the sense of smell underwater. And this has since been found in other small mammals. Um, so that is another part of the story that's really weird, and, and, and meaning that, you know, star-nosed moles have a really bizarre nose. You might think that had something to do with their underwater sniffing ability, but it turns out water shrews, and there's an animal in, Ru in Russia, the Russian Desmond, that, that investigators there have now looked at and, and found that they can do this as well. So maybe many small mammals are actually capable of doing this. So just to sum up this part, um, you know, there's visible brain maps, a touch fovea, ultra fast foraging, underwater sniffing, and much, much more. And I just wanted to sort of go back to the analogy of when you look at this kind of outlier, you never know what you're going to find. And here's a whole bunch of 
interesting things about this one animal that I've had time to tell you about. Okay, now I am going to, I have this metaphorical movie for you. I'm going to turn the page on star-nosed moles and now start talking about another species. And this is the tentacled snake. And it's a different chapter. And it's basically an amazing little snake. It's got tentacles on its face. And this is it under the scanning electron microscope. And I do have to confess here that I'm sort of doing the snake in injustice because it looks very terrifying in this image. But actually, tentacled snakes are innocuous little snakes. Um, and they look, uh, they don't try to bite. Um, they, they basically camouflage themselves and try to look like a stick as they wait to, uh, to hunt and fish for prey. So they, I, I say fish because they are predators that only eat fish. And they wait very patiently in this unusual posture in a sort of J-shaped configuration underwater. They're fully aquatic. They, they basically never come out of the water. And they wait for fish to come to just, just the right spot. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about their brain organization, and then I'm going to move on to tell you about their behavior. So one of the interesting things about tentacled snakes is you might be wondering, why do they have tentacles? And, 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 and so the reason that they have tentacles is in order to detect water motions. And so, the, so nearby fish, of course, generate some disturbance in the water. And this is detected by nerve endings in the tentacles that then project to a structure called the optic tectum. And in the optic tectum, information from different senses converges. So not only does information from water movements from the tentacles go there, but at the same time, visual information from the eye goes there as well. And these two different cues are combined in order to give the snake an extremely accurate view of where its prey is located in space so it can strike at prey. Now, the thing about the tentacled snake though is it strikes, I would call them, more than accurate. So what could that possibly mean for me to say that the strike is more than accurate? Well, I'm going to start with a clue from a guy named John Murphy who wrote this wonderful book about the snakes in this family. And he videotaped tentacled snakes in uh, real time, not in slow motion. And what he said was that um, on some of the successful strikes, the fish disappeared within a single frame of the movie. So that is really weird. How could a snake strike so quickly and efficiently that the snake, that the fish essentially disappeared? And here I've got the magnifying glass because this was, again, a clue that maybe something interesting was going on with tentacled snakes. And sure enough, there was something incredibly interesting. And to tell you about it, I first have to tell you about fish. So this is just to remind me, to remind you that fish are on the menu of lots and lots of predators. So every, every predator likes to eat fish. We like to eat fish. And, and so because of that, fish have evolved a very, very efficient escape response. So they basically have a, what's called a sea start escape response. And it depends on hearing. So you might be surprised to learn that fish have ears. So they can go either left or right. So it's a two directional choice. Either you go left or you go right, and then you swim away very quickly. And this is dependent upon their auditory system because the auditory system is actually faster than vision when it comes to these kinds of responses. And this is the circuit. So I'm, I'm just going to show you this briefly. This has been another one of these so-called model systems, kind of like the, this, the giant axon and the squid that people have studied for many, many decades to learn about how neural circuits function. And in the case of a fish, a sound comes to either the left side or the right side, and then it activates the ear, and then it activates this gigantic neuron, again, a big neuron with a big axon. And that, that one neuron will send an axon, a, a signal down its axon, and it'll essentially activate the muscles along the opposite side of the fish's body. And importantly, it inhibits the muscles on the same side as the attacking predator. Now, the truly amazing thing about this neural circuit is that it activates the escape response so that it will occur within six milliseconds. So 
that's phenomenal because six milliseconds is only six one thousandth of a second. So that's less than a hundredth of a second for this to begin. And so I'm going to show you a videotape now or a video, a high speed video um, filmed at 2000 frames per second and just a fish responding to a water droplet. So you can see firsthand how very quickly they respond to a water disturbance. Okay, so that is some incredible speed to be able to escape in only six one thousandth of a second, or at least to start your escape. So how is a snake to deal with that? So the, the, the tentacled snakes only eat fish. And so they have evolved to deal with this escape response throughout their history. And so now I'm going to show you one of the sneakiest attacks I've ever seen. So this J-shaped hunting posture is actually a trick of sorts, sort of a trap of sorts. So what the snake does is first it moves this part of its neck, so to speak, and that generates the water disturbance that kicks off the escape response in the wrong direction. And then the fish is committed because of that neural circuit and the snake will then start to strike in this direction and essentially sort of literally turn the tables on the fish, so to speak. So I'm going to show you this in slow motion because it's really quite amazing. Okay, that is a, a very sneaky trick and it works great if fish are coming in this direction. But what happens if a fish is coming at you in this direction? So a tentacled snake can, can't scare the fish forward. It can only scare it to the left or the right. And the fish is gonna generate an escape response when the snake strikes no matter what. So what the snake does I think is even more sneaky. So it still generates this, this water disturbance. And this in turn causes the fish to escape in this direction. And then the snake strikes to the future position of the escaping fish's head. So this also, you have to just see it to believe it. So what you're gonna see next is a slow motion videos and a, a black mask will appear over the original position of the fish so that you can see how the two the predator and the prey, how the snake and the fish move together and essentially meet up in a future time. So it's very sneaky. Okay, so that's a pretty phenomenal behavior, a really great trick. And it brings up something that Richard Dawkins has called the rare enemy effect. So why don't the fish evolve to, to essentially not turn in the wrong direction when there's a tentacled snake? And the reason is tentacled snakes are really uncommon. So usually the best thing for a fish to do is to turn away from the water disturbance. And, that's, and, and because that's the best thing to do most of the time, that is what evolution maintains and it's the unlucky fish that run into a tentacle snake and turn the wrong direction. So that's sort of the evolutionary explanation. But you know, you might think in the back of your mind there might be another explanation. And I think sometimes really tentacle snakes are just reading up on the neural circuitry of the escape response in order to outsmart these fish. Okay, so that's the last bit I'm gonna tell you about. There is a lot more to know about these snakes, but I wanna move on to the next interesting animal. And I have, again, my reminder that we're turning a page to a new chapter here. And now I want to tell you about 
electric eels. And the electric eels, I essentially started studying them because I would be teaching about electric eels. And I often introduced my class to electric eels by showing this older picture of a guy named Christopher Coates in the 1950s holding this giant and impressive animal. And eventually I thought, well, this is an outdated photo. Um, it's black and white. Surely I can get some better imagery. So I brought some, some electric eels to Vanderbilt and I started as a photography product, uh, project. And here is one of those animals looking out of the aquarium. I think they're absolutely beautiful animals and they are um, really interesting in terms of their behavior as well. I wanna tell you a little bit about you know, just sort of introduce them to you by letting you know that much of their body is, is made up of an electric organ. And so that's why they're legendary for generating such high voltages because they have this special electric organ. And an electric eel basically gives off pulses of electricity. So if you were to record the signals, um, you could see action, what, what you call, could call action potentials, which are very similar to what nerves neurons give off. So that's going to become interesting. And when each of these pulses is given off, um, there is essentially a dipole electric field that surrounds the electric field. Now you can, the, the electric eel. Um, now you can imagine that if you're giving off hundreds of volts of electricity, people have known about electric eels for centuries. And there are in fact some legendary tales about electric eels. And one of those legendary tales comes from Alexander von Humboldt, who went to collect electric eels in the Amazon. And essentially the only way that the fishermen could help him get electric eels was to do what he called fishing with horses, which was to herd horses into a pool containing electric eels until they sh the, the eels shocked the horses so much that the, the eels were exhausted, ran out of electricity, and then they could be safely collected. It's a crazy sounding story. And I'm actually gonna come back to that because not everyone believed it. But now let me tell you a little bit about the electric eels output. So an electric eel essentially has two kinds of output. It has a low voltage, sensory output. So it has two power settings. One is these low voltage little pulses that it's constantly giving out as a sensory system to probe its environment. And the other are these high voltage pulses that it gives off as its electrical weapon. And I want you to be able to listen into these pulses. So I'm going to play you a movie of an electric eel. You're going to first hear the low voltage as it searches, and then you'll see a little fish in the aquarium, which it's going to attack and eat. And that'll be the high voltage. Okay, here we go. Okay, so where did this get interesting? Things got amazing when I put the electric eels under the slow motion camera. And so now I'm gonna show you, and this was of course a big clue as it usually is when you look in slow motion, that something interesting was going on. So what I'm gonna play you now is slow motion video. And what you're gonna see is the red frames I've colorized for you so that each pulse flashes red so that you can tell when the electric eel was giving off its high voltage. And what I want you to notice is the fish are completely immobilized in only a very brief amount of time. It's actually only three milliseconds. And they're also, they're not dead. So one, the last eel will miss and then you see the fish start to move again. And that tells you that somehow the eel is temporarily, temporarily immobilizing its prey. Okay, so what was going on there? All voluntary movement was arrested in those fish in only three milliseconds. And that was the initial question. How could electric eels possibly be doing this? And the first thing that came to mind was maybe this is like a law enforcement taser, which basically will freeze up your muscles using electrical pulses. And so I managed to explore this by using sort of an unusual preparation. So you can use a dead fish that still has functional muscles 
cells and attach it to a force transducer. And then what I was able to do is essentially feed the electric eel earthworms on this side of an electrically permeable permeable barrier. And the eel is a fish, and it, I, I should mention it only lives in South America, now that I remember to point that out. It's a fish from South America related to other electric fish, and it loves earthworms. So I can just feed it earthworms on this side of the barrier, and then record what happens to the muscles as a result of those electrical pulses. And what it turns out this showed was that each electrical pulse essentially activates the muscles in the nearby fish. In fact, they do it in a one-to-one -one manner. Now, I'm not going to show you all the lots of data that I collected to explore this further, but I will tell you that essentially what I found was an amazing thing, that when the eel commands with its brain, its electric organ to fire off a pulse, it goes through a neuron that that then attaches to and communicates with the eel's electric organ, and that sends the pulse out into the, the water environment. And that then activates a neuron, as it turns out, in nearby fish, which then activates the fish muscle. So literally what the eel is doing is using its nervous system to control another animal's nervous system remotely. Okay, so here's the technical imagery showing all that. Now I wanna show you sort of the summary of what's going on, which is that literally electric eels can remotely control other animals. Now with this finding in mind, we can start to now think more deeply about an electric eel's output. And related to that, I now want to show you something interesting that electric eels do. That is, they give off blips of high voltage while they're hunting. And these blips of high voltage are really interesting. So I'm going to, I'm going to expand the movie and let you listen in on this. So first, it, you'll, you'll hear the low voltage pulses, blip, blip, blip. And then you'll hear what sounds like a click. And that is a blip of high voltage. And you'll hear this especially when the eel investigates a piece of metal because eels are really interested in conductors. And so listen in when they, when they go for that to explore the piece of metal. Okay, so that was a series of doublets. And here's what the, the, the behavior suggests might be going on. If you give off high voltage blips into the water surrounding you, well, what that would do if you were near another animal is cause it to twitch massively. And so this could be the eel's way of asking nearby animals if are you a living thing that I can eat? Because you'd have to respond by twitching. And keep in mind that electric eels are hunting at night in the Amazon, so they're not usually using vision and they're hunting for hidden prey. And essentially what that would cause is the twitch that would cause an electric eel to be able to detect things. Now, why would they be able to detect a twitch so well? I'm gonna show you that electric eels are in fact super sensitive to water movements. So this will convince you, watch how they respond to just a drop of water on the surface. Okay, as it turns out, they actually use this to hunt with, meaning that when prey is hidden from them and they sense maybe there's something nearby, they'll give off a doublet, prey twitch, and then they attack with the full-on high voltage volley. So that's what you're seeing down here as an example. And so now I'm going to give you the punchline of this part of their abilities. They have dual modes of remote control. So if I didn't emphasize this in the, in the first part of their normal volley, they can give off a long continuous volley and that totally freezes up the prey's muscles. That's why those slow motion fish were absolutely absolutely rigid. Um, and, and they also, while searching, if they're uncertain, can give off a doublet, cause prey movement, and then go on to freeze the prey and continue with an attack. Now that's pretty incredible. Okay, so now I want to show you an eel attack a prey item again and tell you something about what goes on. So watch this video. <laughs> Okay, so what you saw there was essentially the eel attacking in its normal sequence of high voltage head movement and suction. And whenever that happens, they give off these air bubbles from their gills that tell you that they've made the, the final bite 
when they attack. Now, the interesting thing about this is that when you have just a water movement, and I'm not going to play this movement, movie again, but when there is no prey atom there, or when there's no conductor there, because prey are conductors, they give off the high voltage, they have a head movement, but they don't bite. And the question is, here's the question, and here this is a clue to something truly extraordinary. Why is that going on? Now, this one's more subtle, so I have to give you a little background information. And this involves the sense called electroreception. So in the 1950s, a guy named Lisman discovered that these weakly electric fish that live in South America, which, is a, which are relatives to the electric eel, and in Africa, um, give off these electric fields around themselves, and they use this to probe their environment. And one of the key things that they're interested in is whether something is non-conductive or conductive. And living things are conductors. And, and I'm sorry, this is a conductor over here. So conductors cause the field lines around the eel or an electric fish to converge. So let me just remind you that when the eel is giving off its low voltage, it's got these field lines creating an electric field around it. Now I wanna show you the sensors to go a step further. So I'm gonna colorize this, this electric eel image. So notice these green pits here. This is how they detect water motion and why they would respond to a water droplet with an attack. But this red area here is what's called electroreceptors. And this is how they monitor their own electric field that is surrounding them as they're going around looking for food. Now, this has always been known about the electric the eel, that it's got a low voltage sensory system that it's probing the environment with. And it's particularly interested in conductors because fish are conductors, and this would tell it where a fish is located in space. It's almost like a, kind of like a radar system, kind of like a visual system, but not quite like either one, because um, we don't know exactly what electroreception is like. But in any case, the question is, why would an electric eel attack and and have a finale of a suction feeding strike when there's something there, but not when there's nothing there. So how does it know in the middle of its strike whether to break off the attack and not bite? And the question that came to mind was maybe they have high voltage electroreception. Now this is something that was thought to be totally impossible, um, but there is a test for this. And the test is to see if the eel can chase and attack a conductor during its high voltage volley when there's no volt, low voltage given off. And so now I'm gonna show you a movie that I think is one of the best examples of electroreception out there. So it's gonna be a circular disc and embedded in that disc is a bunch of plastic circles and there's one conductive disc. So the conductive disc is marked uh, with a small arrow. And first you'll see this in real time and then you'll see it in slow motion. And what it is gonna show you is the electric eel can track and per attack perfectly on target strike for a fast moving conductor while only using the high voltage. So watch this video. Okay, that along with many other experiments showed very convincingly that electric eels have high voltage and they use high voltage as both a weapon to freeze up prey and as a sensory system to track prey. And that is really kind of an amazing, almost science fiction-esque ability. And I can't help but, you know, refer to some science fiction fantasy type stuff. So this is um, the character from um, Big Trouble and little china big trouble in little china that basically it's low pan and he was able to use his eyesight of course not only to see but to fry things as well and that's kind of what it's like for an electric eel it is truly a, an astounding thing that an electric eel can simultaneously see you and also shock you with the same output
seeing you with electroreception, of course. Okay, so having gone sort of the science fiction comparison route, I want to go back to biology and ask, is there anything that compares to an electric eel? And now I have a surprising comparison for you because remember that an electric eel is probing its environment with pulses of electricity. And there is another animal that probes its environment with pulses of energy, and that is an echolocating bat. So it turns out that bats have something called a feeding buzz. And so they give off at a low rate these, these pulses of echolocation pulse until they need to home, on what they're, home in on what they're attacking. And then they go to a very high rate, and this is called a feeding buzz. And I actually want you to hear this. So I went to a park and I used an ultrasound translator. And so what you're going to hear next is um, you'll see the bat flying around. You'll hear its ultrasound translated to what we can hear. And then there'll be three repeated sequences of the feeding buzz so that you can hear what this sounds like. Okay, so I do think there's similarities between bats and electric eels and how they use their sensory system, surprisingly like the way there's a, a, a phobia in a star nose mole for touch and a phobia in our visual systems. And now I'm going to close on this last eel ability that is truly um, also shocking, so to speak. Um, so I noticed while moving electric eels from place to place that they will surprisingly, they'll attack a metal neck, net by jumping out of the water. Now, this is not something that eels would normally ever do jumping out of the aquarium, but when there's a large conductor nearby, they'll do this. And this took me all the way back to thinking about Humboldt's fish story. And I do call it a fish story because a fish story is an exaggerated story that's so strange or surprising, it seems unlikely to be true. So the question is, would electric eels attack a larger animal? You know, a lot of people didn't believe this story to be true, although lots of people reprinted illustrations of it since the 1800s. Um, some people just thought it was ridiculous. Uh, Christopher Coates said it was Tommy Rot. Another investigator said this was completely impossible. So um, with the eels attacking the nets, which they interpret as something living because they're conductors and living things are conductors, I designed some additional experiments. Now, I'm not going to show you all the circuit diagrams and all the different ways that this was done. I'm going to cut to the chase and show you some props filled with diodes that just really bring home the point that electric eels are attacking larger things that threaten them. Okay, so with those movies and a lot of other data in hand, I've published a story supporting Humboldt's account. And amazingly, not long after I published this, this was 216 years later, not long after I published this, a movie got posted to Live Links. And I just have to show you this movie because it's just kind of simultaneously funny and great data. It's a fisherman trying to kill an electric eel. Roda não. Se rodar, ele, se ele vir, a rede pega ele. Mata lá, mata! Ok, so this is what happened to the fisherman. Um, this is one of the examples of the many times electric eels leap up on things in the laboratory, the same exact behavior. And here's a drawing of Humboldt's account of what happened from the 1800s with the eel pressing itself against a horse. So I would say Humboldt wins the day on this, and I certainly believe that's exactly what happened. Okay, with that, I want to thank you for listening and just summarize some of the things that electric eels do. They have two modes of remote control, two modes of electroception, high-speed prey tracking. I didn't even talk about these other abilities, and they most certainly leap in self-defense, just like Humboldt has suggested. And um, I also like to go back to the metaphor of looking at unusual things. You never know what you're going to find. So again, thanks for listening. I want to thank Allison Collette at Princeton University Press and Sarah Henning Stout, who is the outreach person who made this possible for me. Um, and also my funding, National Science Foundation, MacArthur Foundation, Guggenheim Foundation, and my wife, Elizabeth Catania, and Glenn Northcutt and John Koss, all of whom I work with in science. Thanks very much.
Thank you so much for that amazing lecture on all these ridiculous animals. Um, for folks at home, if you enjoyed the lecture, you can purchase Ken's book on the Princeton University Press's website. And if you want a discount, you can use the code KC-FB to receive 30% off. Woo! And now it's time for some Q&A. So if you have any questions at all about anything that happened in that lecture, put those questions into the chat box and I'll ask Dr. Catania. Hey, doctor, how are you doing? Good, how are you guys? You're doing great. I, I really enjoyed that lecture. That was, that was amazing. I feel like you chose the right expertise. Thanks so much. Please <laughs> call me Ken. So. Ken. <laughs> okay. Um, our first question is about the sound in those electric eel videos. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm, that's a great point. You know, I, you get, I get excited about the creatures and sometimes I forget to explain stuff. So um, electric eels are not actually making noise except that I put a couple wires into the tank and then I attach the wires to a speaker. And it's just a way to sort of listen into their secret world of electricity. Um, and, it, and it plays out really nicely and very easily. They just power the speaker with their own electricity. Oh, that's what that is? Yeah, yeah. Wow, that's really cool. <laughs> uh, okay, our next question has a little bit of math in it. Okay. Uh-oh. <laughs> if a... If a human heart will stop with as little as 0 0.007 amps and 0 0.1 amps through a human body being almost certainly fatal, how is the one amp from a single electric eel not fatal to humans? Yeah, you know, um, there's, uh, there's a lot of backstory to that. Um, and essentially, it seems that the heart itself is pretty well protected from currents flowing through the body. Um, so, you know, and I won't, I'm not going to weigh in on the safety of tasers, um, but certainly those folks have uh, got a bunch of publications sort of talking about different amperages. So I think, um, I think what probably is going on is the number for stopping the heart would be directly to the heart as opposed to, you know, through your two arms, which would not present the same current to the heart. And um, I, so one of the things, and I'm, I'm going to have a disclaimer of don't do this at home. <laughs> and um, I am not a physician. So two disclaimers. That being said, um, I don't know of any accurate record of someone being killed by an electric eel in all of history. Um, so um, when you think of that compared to, say, a honeybee, um, you know, electric eels are probably um, made out to be uh, worse than you might think. Um, that being said, they can certainly freeze up your muscles. And if you were swimming around one, I think that could be really, really dangerous. And people might, you know, maybe it's not recorded, but people might drown from that um, sort of inability to swim. So, yeah, I don't, you know, I don't know exactly why they don't take people out, but they really don't seem to. And same with their prey. Till they swallow you. Do you think there's maybe a reason on the eel side to not want to kill their prey before they swallow it? I don't think so. I think that that would be all for the... Um, all for the good as far as the electric eel goes. Um, you know, they are, they're pretty amazing. They'll eat just about any living thing in my experience that they can swallow, but it is true that they, they are so-called gape li limited predators. So they can't eat something bigger than, they don't have big teeth and actually while wearing rubber gloves, I've been, thin ones, I've been accidentally mistaken for food and some have grabbed onto me and they really do nothing um, in terms of the teeth. So the teeth hold on. And I just say that because it's not like they would go after a horse to tear it apart and eat it. Some people might imagine that, um, but that doesn't seem like something they would ever do. Same with people. They're not going to dismember people, um, but I'm sure it would be, well, actually I know that it's not a whole lot of fun to get shocked with them. <laughs> Um, okay, so here's a few questions all in one lump from one person. Let me know if you want to divide it up and I can remind you of okay. questions. <laughs> see how good my memory um, is. So when it is said that electrical eel, electric eels use electricity to navigate and communicate, by which methods do those work? like navigation with Earth's magnetic field or communication with their own field sensory organs? Or what do they communicate? Yeah, so um, 
there it's absolutely clear that they can navigate by detecting objects in their environment. And actually, I kind of like the fact that we don't know what that's like. So I can't tell you that it's the same as vision or it's like a radar system or it's like echolocation. It's totally different from anything that we know about. But you can tell from many experiments that they are detecting objects at a distance. Um, so it is a distant sense of a kind, it, and they detect the the, config, the the sort of the properties of different objects, like their conductance and capacitance, and and things we probably don't know yet. So for sure, they're navigating that way in terms of detecting things. And then it's pretty clear that they can communicate as well. And by, I don't know that the electric eels themselves have ever been studied for for communication so much as all their relatives, the other electric fish, are doing all kinds of interesting electrical signaling back and forth to one another. There's electrical courtship between males and females. There's electrical dominant struggles between males. Um, so there's a whole world of electricity with electric fish, of which the electric eel is one, um, that's going on out there. And I'm, I'm almost certain that electric eels are doing their own communicating. It's just that um, they're kind of inconvenient for people to study because, you know, they're big and they shock the heck out of things. So there's fewer studies on those than on the smaller electric fish. Cool. Um, one person asked, maybe they missed it, but is there an electricity production organ? Yeah. So I only briefly just showed this little red highlighted part. The whole reason that an eel is eel shaped convergent with, they're not related to freshwater eels um, other than being fish. They're very distantly related to them. So they're not closely related to other eels. And the reason they have an eel shape is just so they can house a gigantic electric organ. So like four fifths of their body is biological battery. It's really amazing um, that they exist at all, honestly. Um, and uh so, so that's uh, one part of it. And the history of that is incredible because it actually inspired Volta to stack metals together to invent his battery. And they were one of the reasons we discovered some of the channels that muscles use because there's so many of them to generate so much current. So their electrical battery is, is a big deal, not only to them, but also historically in the history of science for people exploring electricity and making inventions and so forth. Wow, that's incredible. Oh, man. Um, okay, we've got a few more eel questions I'll ask before we move on to some mole questions. Okay. Um, have you been shocked by an eel? I have been shocked by an eel multiple times, some accidentally. Um, and, uh, you know, I... I didn't put it in the talk. Maybe it would have been great entertainment, but I actually did a study with a small electric eel where I let it shock me to learn how much current it could send through um, a, a living creature because they're obviously doing that. And um, it was also, I, I mean, I, I hesitate to use the word fun, but um, you know, working out the circuitry of how the electric eels shock things was a lot of fun because the physics of what an electric eel does pretty much follows batteries exactly. And I'm in the field of animal behavior and animal behavior is really chaotic, but the physical laws of electricity are very lawful. So it was fun to get data that were really beautiful data just from, you know, a, a, that kind of experiment. So it, it worked out well. And I guess I'd just say that um, they're very efficient at deterring predators and scientists. Say, so did it, how did it feel? Like, have you been by like sticking your hand in a second? <laughs> Is it similar or different? Uh, yeah. Um, well, I guess the closest thing I would say is I have backed into an electric fence on a farm before, and uh, it's just very similar to that. Um, yeah. Activates <laughs> okay. all your sensory receptors in a very bad, unpleasant way, but at least it doesn't do any damage. So. Yeah. Um, I think you might have gotten to this earlier. Um, this might just be a quick reminder. How much power can an electric eel generate? Yeah, I'd have to do uh, a little calculating, but I could throw out some numbers. So the ones, I would say about 500 volts for a really big eel, and then a resistance, the internal resistance of a really big eel is about 500 ohms. 
Um, so that does give you, if you short circuit it, about one amp. And then um, I think we'd have to do a little multiple. I forget the power equation. It's, um, it's maybe it's current times voltage, I think. So um, some, someone would have to, 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 it's not in the top of my head, but um, with those numbers, you should be able to, to figure it out. Certainly enough to light up those diodes really, really well. Yeah. <laughs> um, how large an animal can a mature eel effectively paralyze? So what's their limit? Yeah, great question. So one of the things that's interesting about it is size is no defense. So it's not like you need more power to, sh in fact, the, they can't affect little tiny fish, which I, I mean, that, you know, you learn this by just watching what happens. And so um, the Humboldt story of the horse is absolutely true. In South America, when they cross cattle through streams and there's electric eels, it's really bad news for the cattle. Um, so if, and for people too, you know, if you're immersed in the water with them, you will get a major shock and um, just as much as a frog or a fish. So um, yeah, there's not a size limit that I know of. Cool. <laughs> okay, let's see. If they get spooked, can they let out more electricity? You know, like with snakes, sometimes they'll like use yeah. more. That's also, that's a great question. Now they have an absolute fixed power output. They okay. don't lower it and they don't raise it. Now I say that, but it's like, uh, it's like a, a human growing up, you know, you can, that person could lift X amount if they tried as hard as they could, but a year later when they're larger, they can lift more and the next year they can lift more. So that's what it's like with an eel. So any given eel at any point in its time, um, will give off a fixed value for the low voltage and a fixed high voltage value. They use their every single bit of their electric organ with each pulse they give off. Nothing is left in reserve. Um, but what does happen when they get tired is instead of the pulses getting smaller, the pulses come at a longer interval. So as the, so they sort of run out of steam and, and they give off fewer pulses and then they stop giving off pulses. Um. So you mentioned both batteries and science fiction. Um, what do you think about powering cities with electric eels? Probably, I mean, you know, who knows what the future holds, um, except I think that would be hard on the electric eels. I hate to think of all those poor little guys chained up powering our cities. Um, but, you know, people are doing um, bio, what you could call biomimetics, where they're trying to essentially figure out how the organ itself and the cellular structure might allow for new kinds of batteries. And so um, there is a paper in the last five years where they've started to use a electric eel inspired device that one day might be implanted. So that's one of the, you know, the challenges, how do you, how do you interface power sources with the human body? It's hard to stick big metal things in there. So having a biological generator is something that people are actually uh, working on. And I did mention, and it is absolutely true, that Volta, what, Volta, who invented the battery, was very much inspired by the structure of the electric eel's organ to put metals together. And, you know, that's kind of turned out to be important for us. I think we all have batteries somewhere half the time in your pocket these days. So, so yeah. electric eels have definitely added to our ability to generate electricity if you go far enough back. Cool. Oh, man. Okay, I think that's all of our eel questions for now. More might show up. And okay. reminder, everybody, you can still submit questions anytime. Okay, of all the unusual animals you've studied, which is your favorite and why? I have to confess electric eels are my favorite because I have been really blown away uh, by what I've seen animals do, but... Um, I didn't even get to tell you everything that electric eels do. It's in the book though. Um, oh, so that reminds me. Um, so electric eels are for sure my favorite at this point, who knows what'll be next. Um, just because they are such wizards with electricity and they can do so many different things. And, um, you know, related to that, I showed a bunch of movies here. I, in the book, I have put QR codes in that link to movies um, just because I wanted people to be able to see some of the things that I showed in the talk tonight. So there are some other things that they can do um, like 
curling up to amplify the, the, the amount of electricity that they do have, even though it's limited in total power output, they can focus that power. Um, and so that's absolutely amazing. And they, th there's other things that they can do. The list, it's, it's like I, it's like the Ginsu knife commercial. I really mean it. Like the list just keeps going on with these creatures. There's always something else that they can do. And it almost, it keeps me up at night in a really good way to, to think about like, what's the next thing that, that I haven't found out yet. Um, of the animals that you study, you do like are there time periods like an eel your eel like your blue period your eel period your no your mole period yeah. or they're all concurrent that's a, that's a great question um i have found in science now now getting to it, the strategies of of doing science uh multitasking in in, in sciences in much of life is really uh, hard to do. And I think is um, it's, it, you know, by focusing in on something, um, it almost reminds me of, um, well, I wrote my first book and that is something I would not try to write three books at once. And as strange as it might sound, I found lots of similarities in the mental sort of need to concentrate and where ideas come from between writing and, and doing science and collecting data and thinking about data. And in both cases, I think you need to focus on one thing at a time to do it as good as you can. Um, so that's just for me. You know, there might be other people that can do 10 things, <laughs> but just for me personally, since you asked, I, I, it's best for me to focus on, on one thing uh, at a time. So it's definitely been different periods for different animals. Have you found, this is sort of a general science question for maybe there's uh, young people listening that are interested in becoming a scientist. Have you seen, is that usual with your colleagues where they'll just focus on one thing at a time or will they? Yeah, you know, I'm a little bit projects? of an odd Oh, sorry to enter. Yeah, I'm, oh, I'm, yeah a, I'm a little bit of an odd bird in the sense that um, I think I have moved around a lot more in terms of studying different species. So maybe it might be true that a lot of people focus for much longer and dig a lot deeper on each individual subject. And um, I often um, get intrigued by another critter at some point is what what is the commonality between your critters what makes you like oh critter like if you were to what would cause you to move on from eels maybe to a new thing you know um as much as it's it is i try to be data centric and collect you know a lot of good scientific discovery based information i also like a good story and so if i see uh, maybe an unfinished story, uh, you know, for, so electric eels have been studied for centuries and I didn't know that there was an unfinished story there. But when you already know a lot about an animal and you can add to that, that's kind of um, one nice way to sort of see what you might do next. And actually, I should say a lot of it comes from teaching. So I really enjoy teaching my class on essentially neurobiology and behavior. And so when you're teaching, you start to you read what have people done about with animal X or animal Y, and you can get really intrigued with that. And sometimes that'll lead me to a new study system. Cool. Um, for star-nosed moles, what, what is it that they're eating when they hunt in the water? And I think there was some general interest in just learning more about how that underwater hunting works for them. You know, I share that interest as well. I'll, I'll tell you, that is on my to-do list. Um, I'll tell you how it gets even more interesting. So they dive in water. Um, they live way up into the northeastern United States and up into Canada, Canada, and they don't hibernate. And they dive in the water more in the winter than they do in the summer, which seems completely counterintuitive. Like, why would you go into freezing cold water if you're a little mammal that needs to stay warm to try to find food? And, you know, the, a lot of things in, in life and biology are counterintuitive until you get out there and look. I have a, a, I've done just a little bit of sort of back work on that. And it, I'm kind of scared to do the, the winter field work really because <laughs> um, it's so cold up there. But um, what it seems is going on is tons of insects 
lay their eggs and their larvae develop in the water because the water doesn't freeze. So it's a refuge for the invertebrates during the winter. And so what seems counterintuitive on the face of it is a really winning strategy for going to get a very large amount of small invertebrate resources um, during the winter. So I think that's probably the explanation. So there's lots of little invertebrates. If you go and flip a rock on the edge of a stream, you'll find all kinds of little creepy crawlies down there. And that's exactly what people found the starnose moles are eating when they investigated basically the stomach contents in the 1950s when they were looking at that. But related to that, I'll mention, you know, there's always not enough time to say everything. When I showed the teeth, you might've seen these big teeth behind the small teeth. And, you know, for full disclosure on their foraging um, strategies, they'll eat bigger things when they find bigger things. So they definitely can concentrate on little things when they need to. But, you know, if they run into a hamburger, so to speak, in the form of an invertebrate, you know, a nice big earthworm, um, they'll definitely eat that. And so, For those invertebrates that are laying their eggs in the water, are they like suspended in the water or down in the mud under the water? Often laid on the underside of rocks, um, on leaves and, and, and sticks and debris and so forth. So there's, there's sort of spread all around. But I don't know if there's one thing that the mole is going after more than other things. So that's sort of the where I say I'm interested in it too, because I've never actually figured out exactly what's going on underwater. And I think it's a really interesting question. Like what, what, what exactly are they eating? I know they're eating lots of these little things, but maybe there's more to that story. Yeah. And maybe it's little eggs, you know, maybe it's little invertebrate eggs attached to stuff. Um, okay. Do, so that mole in the, in the video was very round. It was very adorable and round. Did yeah. it have a layer of fat to keep them warm when they dive in the water? They don't seem to have much fat, but the one in the video um, had a winter coat on. And if you saw a little bit of a different color, it was actually shedding its winter coat. So they have this super thick layer of, of fur in the winter and then a, a shorter uh, layer in the summer but I don't think they have very much fat. Does that winter coat, can that be like, like shed water shedding to like- keep Yeah, them? absolutely. Oh, they're, they're, it's absolutely water shedding. It's amazing. And the water shrews, um, there, if you've ever seen videos of one of these diving spiders, they have that silvery look where the bubble of air is on them. Um, the, the shrews and the moles are the same way. It's like, it's totally water repellent. And that probably explains, you know, how they can dive in the winter and not get, not not freeze essentially yeah yeah um are the star nose moles genetically related to the moles in our yards in oregon they are actually um you know there are there's i'm trying to remember how many species i want to say seven in the united states and maybe 30 in the world some about that many um, yeah, the ones up there are um, super cool. <laughs> they actually have on their nose, and actually this is in the book, um, they have a little protostar. Um, you have to look really closely, but it's like, it's like you know, the Archaeopteryx uh, dinosaur bird half thing. Well, you know, when I was trying to understand where the star came from, I looked at some of those moles and sure enough, um, it was actually in Tillamook County I was in and um, there's a lot uh, in that area. And, um, they have, a, they have, a, it's really kind of just a very beginning of a star shape on it. That's so cool. I'm going to yeah. need to do this. <laughs> um, for, oh, was it some kind of shrew that had the poisonous saliva? Yeah. Yeah. Was it? It's a short tailed shrew. Short tailed shrew. What is that poison made out of? And what is, how does it affect? You know, I don't know that anybody's really, um, explored it very much. I only know of a few accounts of people being bitten by that animal. And, you know, it does cause a lot of pain and the whole, your whole arm can swell up. Um, but they, but I think that is maybe the most common mammal in all of North America. They are all over the place in grasses. And, you know, a lot of times cats will bring these in. It's maybe one of the most common mammals that people see. They don't always know what it is. It looks like a mouse, but if the eyes are really small and it's got that short little tail, it's, uh, and the other thing is that's weird about these, all of, almost all the shrews in North America, if you look at their teeth, they're kind of red. 
They're, they're dark red. They have iron in their teeth to strengthen them. So these are all little clues that you've got a shrew, um, you know, on your hands. But I don't know what the venom is is composed of. And uh, but what I do know is they are. Um, you know, I hate to uh, hate to speak badly about these guys, but they are pretty ferocious predators in terms of their size. So um, Roosevelt, uh, Eleanor Roosevelt, had one as a pet at some point. And he described it as the most ferocious beast for its size he had ever seen. And it would eat and it would kill and eat little snakes and mice and, and so forth. So um, more impressive than they look in some ways. Yeah. So they don't know what the what the poison is made of, but made of, but are its effects like is it a neurotoxin? Like how does it affect what it bites? It, it might be some kind of neurotoxin because it does seem to like, so this is anecdotal. Uh, you know, I don't, I don't have the, I don't have the studies in my head, but I think when they go after say a frog, um, which is, you know, can be fairly big compared to them. And they, after they bite it a couple of times, it just seems to be totally paralyzed. Um, so there's some accounts like that. So it, it might have a little bit of that in it, but nothing to the level of, you know, a poisonous snake or something along those lines. And, you know, given how many there are and how I think I've only seen maybe a couple of accounts of what happens when people get bit, if you look through all of the papers ever written, um, I don't want to give the impression that they're dangerous and, you know, in terms of human interactions, because they're all over the place and almost nothing happens to people. And I've picked up a bunch before I knew that they were venomous. <laughs> I didn't know when I worked at the zoo as an undergraduate. <laughs> I do know you see them, their remains in a lot of owl pellets. When yes. Owl pellet dissections, you can see those red teeth, which is pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. Not for the shrew, but for, for us. <laughs> <laughs> it's awesome for the owls. Yeah, that's true. Um, okay. We're starting to run down on questions. If you have any last questions, make sure you get them in. Otherwise, I have a final, very serious, very important question for you. Uh oh. If you had a pet eel, if you don't already, what would you name it? What would I name it? I think I'd name it Ernie. Ernie. Nice. <laughs> Like, um, would you consider having a pet eel? I would consider having a pet eel. I feel like I have a hard time with pets I can't touch. I had a well, salamanders you, for a while, and you couldn't you couldn't touch them. <laughs> what, what did you have for a while? Some some sa some salamanders. Oh yeah, yeah. They were they were this like Turkish kind of where you couldn't touch or it would hurt them. <laughs> Yeah, no, I get that. We we have three dogs and two cats, so we have our own ecosystem here, and it's nice to <laughs> touch them. Awesome. Well, I think that might be it for questions. Do you want to do any last plugs for your book? You want to tell us the name? Sure, buy the book. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, no, what would I say? Um, you know, I think one of the things about it is having the movies in there um, is something that's a, that, that hopefully will be like if I say, oh, check out what this incredible wasp can do or, you know, what these shrews can do, you can link to the movies. And all you have to do to do that is aim your camera phone at it and it should automatically take you there these days. So the QR co codes really work pretty easily through a phone. Um, I didn't know that till I, so I stuck these codes in there, but it's pretty efficient. And That's it's basically awesome. the, the story of discovery of these, um, these animals. And my very genuine feeling that I've kind of been on this journey almost to a distant land of biology. And I wanted to tell people about the incredible stuff that's out there because, um, you know, when I use all these superlatives and say, it's amazing, it's incredible. I'm not just sort of trying to say that and to, to hype it. Like I really have a feeling of almost disbelief when I see some of these things. So I wanted to get that across to people. So hopefully that will work in the book. Oh, yeah, I think I might have to buy this book. Um, so for folks, you can use the code KC-FG to receive 30% off great adaptations when you order online or by phone. Please visit Princeton University Press, add the book to your cart, then enter the coupon code KC-FG at checkout. Or you can call their customer service line um, and just tell them verbally, my code is KC-FG, 
and you'll get 30% off the book and free shipping. This offer does expire on Halloween though. So order before Halloween. KC-FG. I think we're going to put that up on a slide so you'll see it visually too. Um, okay, folks, we are out of time. I hope you all enjoyed tonight's event, even a fraction as much as I did. I'm super into this stuff. If you want to watch this video again or share it with your friends, you can check out the video section on OMSI's Facebook page or our YouTube channel. And don't forget to follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter for updates on future events and inspiring content from OMSI. And I know I mentioned it at the beginning, but please consider supporting the Science Pub and making a donation via the Facebook donate button, or you can visit omsi.edu slash donate. Please join us next week on Tuesday, September 29th for a lecture with Dr. Sarah Minson, who is a research geophysicist at the U.S. Geological Survey in Menlo Park, California. And she's going to tell us about Shake Alert, an earthquake early warning system that will provide California, Oregon, and Washington with advanced warning of potentially damaging earthquakes. Um, once again, thanks to our partner Celestream for making tonight's event possible. And as always, you can get more information on all of the things on our website at omzi.edu. So thank you, everyone, and have a wonderful night. Thanks, everyone.